All right, as everyone is settled in, um, I'm going to turn it over again to Professor Parento, who is here to introduce our keynote speaker. So, um, I don't know how many of you have had the challenge and the opportunity uh, to introduce an icon. Um, especially an icon. Somebody grab him before he comes up here and takes me away from the microphone. <laughs> especially an icon who was my boss, was my mentor, was the guy who gave me a chance to practice in this field. Without Oliver Hauck, there would be no Pat Morento. Um, and who, and for those of you who know me, in a rare moment of sentimentality, is indeed a personal hero. Uh, Ali um, is a professor of law at, at Tulane Law School. Um, his brand of teaching is heavily grounded in respect for nature, natural systems, ecosystems. Uh, he believes that, that um, to be a really good environmental lawyer, you, you have to understand how ecosystems work how they look, how they feel, how they smell. And he's noted for taking his students into the Atchafalaya Basin, one of the great river overflow swamps of the world, which would not be a river overflow swamp. And sometimes losing them. Somebody him back out, that's the problem. Somebody hold him down. <laughs> find a potato and put it in his mouth. <laughs> it would not be the Atchafalaya Basin Swamp was it, if it weren't for Oliver Hauck, one of his many great victories over the years, fighting for wild and, and special places in Louisiana and, and every place else. And so his, his, his trips into th this swamp and into the Pearl River Basin of Mississippi are, are legendary among NOLA, uh, and Tulane students, and he's brought most of them back, most of them back intact, despite the fact that he loves canoeing past large alligators rolling off of logs, hornet's nests similar to the tracker jackers you're familiar with from Hunger Games, <laughs> snakes that suddenly appear in large balls that sort of roll along the water, which are moccasins, Oh, look at that, he would say. There's a ball of moccasins. So, Ali definitely grounds his, his law, his teaching in, in, um, in a deep, deep respect for nature. And I just want to share with you a, a, a few of the things that, that people say about him. You've all heard of John McPhee, right? Most of you. Famous uh, writer, very famous writer, New York uh, New Yorker columnist for years, written tons and tons of books. He's, he's known as a nature writer, but when you talk to him at his book readings, he'll say, I don't write about nature, I write about people. And one of the people that John McPhee wrote about in his, in his great book, Control of Nature, is Oliver, uh, when, when McPhee was, was in the Atchafalaya Swamp. And this is how McPhee describes him in that book. Ali features very prominently in that book. Tall and loosely structured, how could be a middle-aged high jumper? Still in shape to clear six feet, his face in repose is melancholy, made so perhaps by the world as his mind would have it in comparison with the world as he sees it. Several years later, another author, author of the book, The Swamp, fabulous book on the Everglades, the destruction of it and the attempts to restore it, um, was reviewing a book that Oliver wrote, um, Down on the Batur, or is it Batur? Batur, which is the, the uh, area along the Mississippi River that Ollie and I have walked and, and bicycled and spent many, many fond memories at, and, and Ollie spent a lot more, and he's written this, a fabulous book about it. And as Grunwald was reviewing the book, he said, Hauk is now 20 years past middle age, but he's still at Tulane, still living in New Orleans, and still battling the core, the oil industry, and other reliable ravagers of southern Louisiana. It is no surprise that the world that he sees still fails to live up to the world he, that he imagines. The surprise is that when he decided to describe these world words on paper, he turned out to be an even better writer than McPhee. 
Nobody writes like how. Nobody. With wit, God help you if you're on the receiving end of it. Um, with substance, with depth, with an incredible style that you just can't resist. Um, Taking Back Eden is one of many uh, of House books uh, about the is it eight great court cases around the world uh, that established environmental precedents. And you know some of the things that, that people have written about that book. This book could only have been written by environmental law's greatest storyteller, a synthesis of opportunity, courage, slapdash enthusiasm, a relentless pursuit of good law by well-motivated people. That by the inestimable Bill Rogers uh, at the University of Washington. And then Mark Hertzgard, author of Earth Odyssey. Oliver Hauck is a most unusual law professor. He writes with wit and even humor, but also great brilliance and compassion. Read him and learn. There really is only one Oliver Hauck and we are very, very lucky to have him with us here today. I'll hand it you. Pat, I hope someday I get the chance to do that to you. Um, uh, I think what I should do, given this introduction, is just sit up here and write for a while. <laughs> um, um, as far as being an icon is concerned, uh, Someone recently gave me an award, an organization for being distinguished, and I asked my wife what she thought distinguished meant. And she said, no longer dangerous. <laughs> and I think icons are at that level too. <laughs> no longer dangerous. We were at one time, um, Pat and I. Um, and now Pat and you, how lucky you are. Um, and how lucky am I? to be back up in Vermont from Louisiana, which, as you may suspect, has a very different view of, of the Green State. Uh, for one thing, it doesn't produce any oil and gas, and that says it all, right? Um, it is free riders. Uh, and the other is, is you're somewhat kooky, um, according to a reporter who just came back after disappointingly failing to see enough fall leaves in color, uh, said that the people up there um, take their trash and put it in different colored little bags. And um, she considered to be a bit ridiculous. Um, um, so imagine my pleasure in reading my first day here, the Brattleboro Reformer. There it is. It's not an impressive newspaper, but the headlines are <laughs> amazing. And it says Vermont leading the way. Well, let me tell you, down south, if if it were Louisiana leading the way, I would turn to Lisa and I would say, Oh God, what is it this time? Um, <laughs> incarceration for adult uh, uh, child abuse. Uh, but you are leading the way in recycling. All the little bags that you're separating are producing so much profit and reducing the waste load so much in the Brattleboro area in that uh, management district that they're sitting on roses, they're sitting on money, and they're sitting on results. Um, so, yeah, leading the way. Um, and the other, uh, take here was nuclear plant prepares for decommissioning. It's Vermont Yankee. I want you to know that plant is the proud offspring of uh, Energy Corporation, which is our Fortune 500. Uh, so you're reaching pretty far south here. And uh, to my recollection, Vermont Yankee's last brush with the law was with the Vermont uh, law, uh, law Center here in Patton in a hellacious, uh, God, multi-year and then three or four month trial um, <coughs> over aquatic impacts and fisheries impacts, and thermal discharges. It bruised them, I'll tell you, it bruised them all the way down to Louisiana. They knew we were in the fight, we hear about it, um, and the publicity was all bad. I have to think, even though that case lost, that it entered into the calculus 
uh, to, to pull the plug. Um, uh, you never can tell where the rip will spread. In this field, sometimes you win the case, Calvert Cliffs, and they go ahead and build it anyway. And in other times, you lose the case, and, and but something great emerges from it. And I think this is an example of that. To come even fuller circle, though, um, the same issues that you all were raising with Vermont Yankee were the issues that were first raised with nuclear power in the first place, um, which was thermal discharges and aquatic impacts. Uh, the first hearings, contested hearings, were Indian Point 1, Indian Point 2 by NRDC and Calvert Cliffs. Um, Indian Point, uh, uh, striped bass, and uh, uh, Calvert Cliffs, uh, the Maryland blue crab. Uh, so uh, these issues don't go away, but what comes full circle here is that um, following the Calvert Cliffs victory, um, uh, several of us, of us who were involved, and I was on the periphery only, had a meeting in Bethesda, a what now meeting. So not a TLD, a TMDO meeting, what now? And uh, there was Tony Royceman, who had litigated the case, who's now up here in Hanover, I understand. Um, uh, Mike Cherry, who did Consolidated Power out of Chicago, um, and some others, and they divided the field. It was just like as if you were sitting here saying, okay, TMDLs, what we're gonna work on is new numbers, and what we're gonna work on is, is implementation plans. And we're, so we divided the field, and uh, um, there was a silent man there who, on this very hot day in early September, raining, sultry, was wearing a wool suit and a wool jacket that he never took off and a tie. The rest of us were pretty much stripped down. He was Harvey Carter. He came from Bennington, and Harvey uh, launched the first of the cases against Vermont Yankee here, um, and he had a theory that after, after, after the pie had been divided, he says, I've got a theory that the whole Atomic Energy Commission is in violation of the Constitution. It's a violation of due process because it has the statutory commission to regulate uh, the safety of this activity that it also has the statutory duty to uh, promote. And so uh, that's a conflict. The government moved to dismiss, it lost the motion to dismiss, Congress took up the issue, and as you know, they broke up the AEC into the NRC and the Department of Energy. That came out of Harvey Carter of Vermont. So I think the point is that Vermont may be way up there on the map that he could reach down and bite you um, <laughs> um, in, in significant ways. Um, and it can also lead you when you think of uh, the well-known bottle bill, billboard bill, in which, by all things, my mother-in-law was deeply involved, um, um, told me, to my not knowledge, I had no idea she was doing this stuff. Um, and uh, Act 250, uh, the Vermont Law Environmental Program, all of these are, are, are leaders, to say nothing Bernie Sanders. I mean, uh, I mean just think about it. If whatever happens to Bernie and his candidacy, he's clearly pulling the debate and he's leading the way in, in another direction. Um, uh, so, Godspeed to you. Um, the, uh, in the short time I have with you today, given your extensive coverage of the TMDLs, um, this is something I've also paid attention to. I wanted to add two thoughts that haven't come up and probably won't come up. And one is, I'd like to deal with a myth that haunts this area. And then I want to deal with money. And I have no idea how to deal with the money, so I have more questions about this than I have answers. But until we deal with the money, we're hurting uh, throughout the clean water. Um, but let's begin by looking at the Clean Water Act. Put yourself back in the room that I was in three years ago, 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act at Harvard and Cambridge, and it was a collection of people who had been involved either in the drafting of the act or in its early implementation. And uh, now it was a retrospective. How do we do? 
Um, and the feeling in the room was very self-congratulatory. <laughs> they felt the you know, best thing I ever did sort of feeling. Um, how would you grade the Clean Water Act overall? If you were to give it a grade, I mean, would you know now? The, the grade in the room that I happened to be in three years ago was A. Um, would you have a grade? Anybody want to offer a grade? Something less than an A? C. A C. And, and uh, the reason the reason it's not an F is what? Because we did a pretty decent job on the point source. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. And why did we do a good job with point sources? What worked with point source? He will cold call, so. <laughs> no, no, what I mean is, what, what, what worked? What, I mean, what was it that made point source work? You had a direct regulatory structure, you had a permitting system. Correct, had a permitting system. And what's the permitting system based on? What was the standard? Numbers. Numbers. And where did the numbers come from? Science. Science. No, it did not come from science. That's what they threw out. That was the old program. Technology. Technology. The engineers won. The scientists lost. Um, they came up with an entirely new objective set of numbers. And, and one that even a judge could understand. Um, yeah, you can do this. You can put a, you can put a sock in it. You can put it in a hole. You can do something. Um, so uh, you went from battle of the scientists to some relatively clear-cut engineering that, when the dust settled, uh, produced this incredibly high standards. Permit standards, and there was one other element in there that was this huge. Citizens. Citizens, citizens absolutely right. Citizens over the government. So the feds came in, Trump the state. Technology came in and Trump science. And uh, citizens came in, sort of Trump government. And that really moved the ball for about 20 years. I mean, that was incredible. It was brand new. And it took the Clean Air Act and, and uh, RICRA and the other pollution laws decades to catch up those very simple propositions, um, which they eventually did. So that's the good part. And then the reason it's a C and only a C is not point, right? Is that where you are? Yeah. That's where I am. Um, so I'd like to hold that piece for a moment and talk about uh, this question of myth. First of all, do all of you have a sense with this Clean Water Act, as I do, that it's reached something of a plateau? I mean, we picked not only the low-hanging fruit, we picked the middle fruit, and it's really tough to get new BAT. That wasn't supposed to be the case. We were to be at zero discharge right now. I mean, you talk about an aspirational act. That was the other thing about this act that I didn't mention, but that was so noticeable in the room. It was that this was an act that didn't talk about balance, and it didn't talk about uh, um, uh, rational use of water, and it didn't talk about pollution control. They threw that right out of the title. It was about clean water. It was about stopping pollution. It was about zero discharge. It was about total restoration. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I don't think there's another act in our lexicon other than the Endangered Species Act that speaks in terms of that kind of absolutes. And even the ESA has more wiggle room than this one. Um, in terms of the ambition, it was huge. But it was also impossible, right? I mean, you just couldn't get this zero discharge. So does that make it ludicrous, or did, what, was, what was the effect of, of the impossible dream? Disillusion. Pardon? Disillusion. Disillusion, which, by whom? Citizens. Huh. Um, yeah, I think disillusion. And would, it, would they have more illusion and less dissolution had we say, we're going to manage it for uh, uh, the, whatever local people want water to be used for? Um, um, I think sometimes, and I think here's what happened in these cases, early DuPont, early Wirehouse, EPA was left with a number of calls to make in very short order on very scant record uh, to meet um, uh, a range of, 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 uh, of deadlines and to fill out some statutory terms, including how would you develop BAT? Um, and EPA I had hopped their way into a process that was immediately challenged. And uh, 
the Supreme Court in DuPont holds so. No, EPA can work their way through. After all, the purpose of this act is clean water. It's to restore. And if this gets us there, that purpose and goal of the act is trumping. It's pivot deciding. It clears an ambiguity. It errs on the side of EPA. And the same thing came in Weyerhaeuser when the pulp and paper industry said, hey, we're discharging into the Pacific Ocean. That can't be pollution. You can't find it out there. The court says, well, no, that's gone. We've got a new act. The purpose is to end pollution. This is the way they're going to end it. So to some, that's terribly unrealistic. But what happened was it drove the act forward with an incredible amount of momentum. I don't know whether you feel the same way I do, but I feel that momentum greatly diminished right now. And there are a number of factors that work in there, and I think you're familiar with them. But one of them is the renaissance of benefit-cost analysis, which has now turned into benefit-cost of each additional increment of burden, so that with each new expense, you had to have a corresponding outweighing benefit. It's not overall gross benefit-cost. It's each increment benefit-cost. And then it's turned into, in Cass Sunstein's world, least cost. So if we can get a reasonable amount of pollution for least cost, then that satisfies the act. So money has come in in an invidious way and controlled what was to have been an is-it-technologically-possible process into an is-it-practical process, which was certainly not, I don't think, the intent of the framers of this bill. And the second was, the corollary to this, is the disappearance of the goals. I don't think I've read in a recent court opinion at the appellate or Supreme Court level a mention of the EPA goals in the last 20 years. They just, you know, the goals that drove the early interpretations of the act are now, what, PR, gloss, they're tossed. So I've often thought, and I think there's a very good case to be made, that Congress's stated goals are the way you should interpret ambiguities in the act. If they say we want to get this done, then that's a pretty good indication of which way a word should be interpreted. But that's not au courant. So the goals have diminished. The BC has come in with a vengeance. And as far as citizen suits are concerned, as Pat's work and others has pointed out, there's more citizen suits right now brought by industry and trade associations than there are by environmental groups. And that's a stunning statistic. But citizen suits have become a double-edged sword, and one that, as you can see, everything EPA has tried to do for the last eight years under Lisa Jackson, now her successor, has been block, 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 block. And the same is true with DOI. So that's where we are. And that brings me to the point I really wanted to make here, which is that there has been a concomitant rise in a myth that the Clean Water Act is really, and this is quoting the Supreme Court, an act of federalism, close quote. And by federalism, the court is explicit in emphasizing state primacy. And actually, we faced this in the 70s with some of the first cases that Pat Perrano ever launched. In fact, cases he brought with him to the office, which was the question of whether dams and the discharges from dams were point sources. And in the South, those discharges from dams in the Pacific Northwest can be ruinous to water quality and to aquatic systems. So Pat brought a series of cases, two district court cases he won, on the theory that, yes, dams are point sources. And then it went up to the, one of them went up to the D.C. Circuit. And in an astonishing opinion, and that opinion must still get you mad, the court agrees with Pat on every point. Yes, these are discharges. Yes, they are of a pollutant. Yes, they come from a point source. Yes, they have extraordinary impact. 
But the act is an act of federalism. The EPA has options, and EPA can always handle dams under, at this point there was no 319 program, can always handle uh, uh, problems like dams also under the 208 program, which, is, which is, has left the stage a long time ago as a, as a, as a, as a flop of several studies. Um, so um, even early on came this warning bell that um, uh, technology standards could be trumped by 402 requirements could be trumped by. The NBDES program could be trumped by the state programs. Um, and that's playing out now with uh, certain thermal impact and intake uh, issues as well. So EPA deferring to state management in lieu of setting a tech standard. Um, and it comes up again with 404. Um, Rapanos and Swank both are copious in their reference to state primacy, therefore we shouldn't extend uh, Section 404 to these kinds of weapons. Um, and uh, it comes up with great relevance to today in virtually every one of the TMDL cases. I'm sure that in every TMDL case in which you participate, you raise state privacy. Um, and, uh, but the point I want to make is I think it's a myth. Um, um, there's, uh, if you consider the 313 program, the Water Quality Standards Program, uh, in retaining a water quality standards program, Congress put EPA either right at the initial, not at the, right either as the initiator, i.e., water quality criteria, EPA to those. But if they're not initiating, they're approving. Uh, they're approving the criteria. They're approving the use. They're approving the anti degradation policy. They're approving the water quality standard. They're approving. The, receiving the, uh, the uh, report card, uh, the, the, biennial, the biennial reporting. They're, uh, uh, they're receiving and supervising the triennial, triennial review. And then, if they don't like what they say, they're to do it. So, I mean, does that sound like, a, uh, you know, the last word in independence and in primacy for the states? It sounds more like the kid in school, right? Now, I don't mean to downplay state significance under this act, but to say they have primacy even under the water quality program is an enormous stretch. They just don't. Um, and that also can be said for the TMDL program, which, by the way, was written in one day at the very last minute, uh, added to the act by uh, three people who were uh, uh, a Senate staffer, uh, Leon Billings for Muskie, a, uh, uh, a, a staffer for uh, Howard Baker, a Republican leader, and uh, the head of Clean Water Action named David Zwick, that, uh, that you may remember, who uh, was as much an environmental activist as Pat is, and that's saying a lot. Um, and uh, uh, they sat down and they said, if we have to give something to the states here, and the word from our from senators is, you got to give them something, or the House won't go along. They, they wrote out the TMDL program, and according to David, it was, uh, it, it was zero escapes. So although the states go first in the TMDL, EPA approves every piece of it. The lists, the TMDL, and even the 303 the planning process. So there's no place that goes beyond EPA review and approval. Um, so this language that now frequently appears, that uh, this act is about uh, some sort of uh, shared relationship with the federal government in which the states have primacy is, is simply wrong. But here's the problem with my argument. It's what the act says. And there's a reason the act says it. And it's a little like holding on to a piece of furniture in your attic and having it continue to run the house. Um, back in 1948, when the federal government entered into the water quality business, 
states wanted nothing to do with federal involvement in this. This was their game. So the feds only offered to give the states money to have water programs, grants. It was a grant program. And ever suspicious of encroachment, the states had language inserted in the bill saying that uh, it is the policy of the Congress to protect and preserve the uh, primacy and rights of the states in control of water pollution. I mean, it could not be more explicit. Um, so that policy statement was the uh, one of the only two policy statements in those early bills. And it was absolutely true. The states had all of the calls. The feds just paid money. And that was true when the act was uh, was uh, redone in 56, redone in 61, redone in 65. All of the acts leading up to this were federal grants and aid program with a virtually non-existent federal role um, until the 72 act that changed everything. Um, but they kept the language in. My gift is they kept it in as a sock, they kept it in as a facade, or they kept it in by accident. But, but what, the, what the language says is so clearly contradictory to what the act does that they simply make no sense. So it's like having a facade, and then the real theater is playing out uh, to the side. But uh, that facade has served uh, states and industry well in deflecting EPA uh, 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 initiatives across the board, and particularly TMDLs. Um, it gives EPA and the states all the cover they need to argue, uh, go home, it's our game. Um, okay. The other point I wanted to raise with you, I'd I just like to put a stake through the heart of that concept if I can, because I've seen it one time too many. Um, I mean, Pat, how could they ever have concluded in your cases that even though it's a point source, I'm not going to require it to be controlled as a point source. How did they get there? Um, or how did they get to 404 being a state program? Um, read it. Um, well, no. I'd like to move to money because I think uh, if there is a gap in the act, it just has the money all wrong. Um, when you think about it, there is no financial incentive for anyone to comply with this act, ever. Not industry, not the states. Um, um, everything's a cost. Um, and uh, um, I come back to this concept of, of, of the uh, of the Brattleboro Recycling Act, pay as you throw. Whatever happened to the concept of pay as you throw? As you know, um, the, uh, when the act was debated, an initial decision was whether to treat pollution as something one taxed and abated through a kind of a, a carbon tax-like mechanism, or to move with a regulatory scheme. They quickly jettisoned the tax as a right to pollute. And the people who took that seven, made the 72 law were in no mood to grant a right to pollute it. No way. Um, so they looked at money, and they rejected money, and they said command and control instead. That led to that PAT, and that's led to the plateau. Um, and that makes discharges after you do VAT free. Um, but why should that be? Why don't polluters pay? It doesn't matter if they're meeting VAT. Why don't they pay? And if they did pay, and the pay was, if the fees were significant enough, why does that not lead to the next round of BAT? Because some of them, in order to avoid those payments or to minimize them, are going to develop technologies 
that will uh, then become a standard that EPA and others can grab onto and say, hey, time to ratchet up on this. Um, so, um, it uh, seems to me that it's a very fertile field to look at a something like BAT plus. You keep BAT, but then you add a fee. And uh, this is not unheard of. Germany does it, Colombia does it. And the fees there are based on toxicity and on um, volume. How you would base it here, I don't know. I believe you had at one point here in Vermont, and you may still, a uh, professor who dealt a lot with the economics yeah. and the fees. Is the person still here? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, environmental taxes. Okay. Well, she's the person who wants to be in the room, but it seems to me that what this field reviews is a very applied analysis, not a theoretical analysis. We could all agree that, yes, if people get taxed heavily on something, they tend to do something else or reduce it. Um, but how would that apply to water discharges? <laughs> what some states do in this field is they assess fees, but they use the fees to fund the department. I don't know whether you do that here. Your dischargers pay fees and it helps fund your DEQ. Yes. Yes, okay. Well, uh, Louisiana does too. But the fees are low and they're basically a way of saving the state fisc. Um, they're not a way, of, they're not set at levels that dissuade. So I'm wondering whether a really good exercise couldn't be find the dissuasion point for dischargers and put your fees at that dissuasion point, a point that will not cripple the initiative. It doesn't shut the industry down, but it requires the, it makes feasible alternatives that otherwise might not be available. Um, so that is, uh, that's one thought for um, pursue. Corollarily, could EPA require states to, or encourage in some way states to uh, adopt a BAT plus fee system? <coughs> Does it have that authority? Um, could it be part of a state approved program? Or are those parts of the state approved program so statutory, statutorily uh, cabined that no additional um, uh, would, be, would be necessary? I should think that even fiscal conservatives would be willing to entertain a proposition of the use of fees uh, uh, to uh, address pollution rather than more command and control by top. Um, we're thinking about. Um, as for a non-point, the money is wrong two different ways. One is simply that uh, not only do non-point discharges not pay fees, we pay them not to pollute. I mean, that's rather amazing. And we have these several programs that have been mentioned here, 319, uh, uh, the ag programs, um, nutrient trading, which is just another way of getting somebody else to pay for it, right? Nutrient trading, people in cities are paying people in agricultural areas not to pollute. Um, uh, so there's something of an equity problem there as well. But um, it's... Uh, so we clearly have the money wrong here. Um, the question would be whether there is a method of assessing fees for uh, non-point runoff. Do we not already calculate that runoff for purposes of the TMDL? I think we do. Certainly Germany and other countries have rather, rather sophisticated um, uh, um, assessments of, of runoff. So if that's the case, adding money to that quantity doesn't seem to me to be technically impossible. Now it could be, it may be politically impossible, but what about um, using it as a carrot or a stick so that one would, uh, an agribusiness um, would uh, develop a BMP, and if the BAP is, 
his approval, um, then it pays nothing. But if it doesn't develop a BMP, or if it doesn't comply with its BMP, then it's subject to this, in effect, non-point discharge tax or fee. So it isn't across the board, but it's an incentive. Somehow, we need to change the money so that people make money by doing the right thing and lose money by doing the wrong thing, and that's entirely absent in this act. Um, um, and even on a, a larger level, when you think of agriculture in particular, the amount of money we're putting into these pollution control programs for agriculture is absolutely dwarfed by the subsidies these same corporations receive for the production of these crops. In other words, we're paying them staggering amounts of money in corn subsidies, for example, for, to pollute. And minute amounts of money in uh, 319, uh, put in a little shelter belt, build a fence uh, um, uh, to, to abate. It's just it's crazy. We're paying for our own death there. Um, and so uh, that seems to me to be clearly a legislative matter, but again, it's probably something that perhaps even, you know, um, uh, Rand Paul could understand. He could see the, the economic incongruity of what's going on here. Um, um, <clears throat> there's another kind of power here that's missing, and that is, so far we've talked about power over recalcitrant or non-complying uh, individuals and farms. I'm about done. Um, but the, uh, another, the other actor is, what do you do with non-complying states? What do you do with hell no states? Um, and uh, um, uh, it uh, The model in the, C, in the Clean Air Act, uh, and the reason states are going through with bourbon Clean Air Act programs is, well, why are they bothering to do this? Because they lose highway money, and they really want highway money, right? So the ultimate money leverage in the Clean Air Act is the loss of highway money, and that gives environmental requirements some clout. Is there any corresponding leverage in the water world any other federal thing that happens, highways relate to air, right? What relates to water so that it's the threat of its diminution could affect state performance? The only thing that comes to my mind is POTWs, but it's so counterintuitive to take away POTW money when it's a cleanup money, right? So, uh, you know, uh, as with the uh, um, well, as with other issues, the thing I like about today is it's opening my head to things that I should be thinking about, and I hope it opens your heads to the possibility of perhaps convening a, a follow-on. You know, if you had another day here, a half day, and, and, and did working groups on some of these things, I've got some really good ideas. <laughs> Um, I'm not saying mine are really good, but those, you know, this is a little like talking with me. This is a lot of stuff going on in the air. Um, I want to make a couple of comments, too, about TMDLs in another year. One is it is a fight over numbers. And two, numbers can be done for nutrients. And uh, some states have them already, and they don't fight it. And the reason other states are fighting it isn't because it's scientifically impossible. It's because it's going to lead to consequences, and they don't want the consequences. Once there's numbers, then they're going to have to meet the numbers, and uh, they'll avoid that like a play. And so the major battles here have been battles over numbers, either in Florida, both in Florida and in Mississippi. Uh, and the only way Florida finally dodged that bullet after 17 years of uh, opposing numbers um, was, or dragging it out to the point that it would never happen, um, was to finally accept nutrient numbers, but then in a planning process make them irrelevant, which is what offense they did. But alternatively, um, if you fail the number in Florida, it has no legal significance. It's called basically an indicator. It's an indicator may be a problem. 
And then you go through at least three years of biological studies, and you're back to narrative criteria in order to determine in some fashion that the balance is offset, whatever that means. So um, uh, these are really difficult wars, which is why I liked and related to, and I kind of had it in my head, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as Dave uh, was speaking this morning, that what the Chesapeake Bay program did was finesse the numbers. They didn't start with numbers. They said, we've got this huge area, the Chesapeake Bay, and we know we got to cut loadings by, we're going to say arbitrarily, 40%. In order to get that there, we're going to allocate that percentage among ourselves. There was no, no science involved in that other than determining that the bay was in trouble and that it would take uh, uh, so much reduction in loading to, to alleviate its pain. We have that same information, by the way, right now with the Gulf of Mexico. If that, that, that ridiculous hypoxia task force has at least produced the numbers to show what the loadings would have to be. And there are further pretty good allocations of those loadings upstream, i.e. we know where those, state by state, we know their contribution, high percentage. That's known. Um, so why isn't that enough to go forward? Is it possible to leapfrog the bottom up, this segment, look at its characteristics, develop its numbers, look at the inputs, allocate among, is it possible to finesse that and just go to the result? We want in this watershed to knock it down by X. Can we agree on that? Okay, we'll agree on it after a lot of chat. Uh, and after that, we'll talk about allocation. And after that, we'll talk about uh, uh, individual responsibility. And maybe the individual responsibilities they can pick on, on, on the other one. But um, it seems to me that Dave's idea of leapfrogging this um, is, is worth another look. Um, query. Uh, I want to be clear what, what you just said. You're taking by, by leapfrog, you mean going to a smaller unit, uh, a sub basin, and starting there rather than the whole. No, what I really meant was, was the Chesapeake Bay, they didn't start with the smaller unit, they started with the huge unit. Yeah. And the same could be done with the Mississippi drainage. And this, this uh, in a way, harmonizes more than one might think with your comments earlier that. What we really need to do is get to PMPs and practices that everybody can agree on. If we can get there, screw the numbers. Let's just get there. And, and, uh, and we have all the information we need on the Mississippi watershed to allocate this on the basis of responsibility, i.e. contribution, if we wanted to. That's there. And, now, uh, and so maybe you come to New Orleans and we talk about this. Bring some. Um, and, and, but I really think you, could, you can get there on the Mississippi uh, in a way that doesn't force the states through these, uh, the mandated numbers. We don't want anybody telling us numbers. Okay, we'll tell you numbers. We're gonna give you a, we're gonna give you a state goal and we're gonna let you come up with a plan to meet that goal and we'll review the plan. Um, um, not, I, 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 all I'm saying is that's the approach I was suggesting, okay? Um, um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is not only do these wars in GMBLs and numbers, but they involve the plan, right? You heard a lot about the plans. What remains a mystery to me, even after talking with girls here who work with plans, and there are people here in this room whose who's, uh, contact on a daily, weekly, yearly basis with TMDLs greatly exceeds mine, um, the Conservation uh, Law Foundation, uh, Nina Bell's group, Northwest Advocates, and the rest, and others that, that I know here. Um, the, uh, um, and I still can't get this resolved. Why is it that you can't get to a plan requirement out of the existing language of the TMDL? TMDLs are to be um, prepared and to arrive at levels that are necessary to achieve water quality standards, right? Necessary. Well, how do you know what's necessary unless you have a plan that, you're re that you have reasonable assurances can be 
Implement it. If you have a plan that doesn't have a, a chance in hell of working, then you haven't developed a TMDL. You developed a piece of baloney. <laughs> um, um, and so it seems to me that the logical progression here goes from necessary to reasonable assurances to plan. And I don't see any way to break that chain. I think EPA has plan in its muscles already, if it wanted to flex them now. Of course, it's going to bring a lot of headaches to it, uh, um, a lot of political headache, and even the responsibility, perhaps, of going in and preparing plans its own, which it never wants to do, right? Uh, but, um, uh, so my take out of this, of this session, and I've uh, left too little time for our own colloquy, is, is uh, that there are really interesting things to chew on here. One is changing the money, point source, one is changing the money with non-point source, and one is taking a closer look both on jumping the numbers with, uh, you know, let's just get to, cut to the chase, let's just get to the allocations and agree on them at BMPs and get on with it. Um, and another is, uh, let's just get to the plans, if we have to have these plans, uh, enforceable plans through uh, through this, uh, this chain that leads to reasonable assurances at least to plans. So, I'm sharing with you kind of thoughts I haven't thought of, well, only on the margins for years. But I'm coming back to this like Rip Van Winkle, and, uh, um, and it's very alive. I've got a lot of hope for this act. I, I, I've got a lot of hope for this program. You know why it's going to work? It's going to work because people really care about clean water. They care about clean water, I think, they care about anything else in a medium. I mean, even climate change, believe it or not. I think people are so attracted to their local water, and they're so tied to it. My guess is there are more water groups in this country than there are all other kinds of environmental groups combined. Um, you know, all the river keepers and this keeper and that thing, I mean, the groups that do water are just ubiquitous. They're very active. Where does that come from? Um, it comes from the heart. Um, and uh, so that's why we're going to win. Celius. Thanks. I think we got about five minutes if uh, anybody wants to do that rather than go to the bathroom. Uh, uh, feel free. Fire. You're from Louisiana. Yeah. In my experience in Louisiana, if a dog barks or a tree falls, then a court lawyer comes out of the woods and files a lawsuit seeking damages. That's what the that's what industry would, would have you think. Well, you know, it depends. So I, I'm going to channel that. It depends how 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 expensive that is. Well, I, I want you to think positively. Who think positively? Why are think we not bringing in a private suit on what? Why aren't, we suing, why aren't we suing over unregulated <laughs> producers of non-point pollution? Is there, is there an opportunity to, to marshal the tort system to, to gain the monetary contributions to impose the monetary discipline Who would have standing? And my, my problem with your solution is... Who would have standing? Victims. Like who? Is the fishermen? Some fishermen. This is a mass tort. Um, um, it's certainly a uh, it's a class action. Um, and your defendants are. I mean, are we suing drainage districts like the Iowa case? Are we suing states? States for what? All I can say is states. I think with are immune, but beyond that, what? This seems a lot easier than, than going after the handful of utilities in the Midwest as the source of the, the carbon pollution. That's a hard case. It seems to me producing, going after, say, the major sources of pollution in Missouri Bay uh, on behalf of those who use and enjoy. Uh, the maps, okay, 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 we're talking the Mississippi? No, I'm just not, I'm 17 talking. states, we're talking, we're talking producers of every stripe of the rainbow, every size in the, in the grocery store. I, I don't know. 
How about the fertilizer? I don't know. The fertilizer manufacturers, are they committing a tort? Product liability is claimed. Um, think about it. Is it a, is it a inherently un, uh, uh, injurious product? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yes and no, right? I mean, clearly no. Um, so, um, I mean, I agree, that, and I agree, you know, that ought to lead to taxation and caps and other kinds of calibrations on it, but liability? Um, it's pretty difficult. We, by the way, speaking of liability, are bringing a case in New Orleans by our levy board against 97 oil companies for civil liability for destroying the marsh between the city and the Gulf of Mexico. The absence of which marsh requires the levy board to build its levees twice as high and cost everybody millions and millions and millions of dollars to maintain forever. If New Orleans can be maintained forever, which really is in doubt, uh, no matter what we do. Um, so, um, so we have, we are not prone to bring, you know, only safe civil actions. In fact, this one got thrown out for an appeal in the, in the fifth, but, um, um, but I don't see, I don't see the target on this one. Matt's got the target, because uh, he's suing EPA to impose these standards and create the TMDL. Query for Matt, query for all of you. The only time that a mega TMDL has been tried is in the Chesapeake, and they had the agreement going for them and the, and the legislation going for them to set up the program. Could EPA, in its own initiative, impose a Mississippi Basin wide TMDL, 17th state TMDL? Um, more to think about. Matt would say yes. I think you've tucked that in your suit, haven't you, Matt? Haven't you asked for Team Leo? Yeah, we, we asked for it in the petition, but that uh, the suit is is uh, basically just on the yeah. on their criteria. Yeah, yeah. But I would love to see the billboards of Have you been impacted by the dead zone? Please contact so and so. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I had thought of that. <laughs> right. If you drive through New Orleans, the largest billboards in the city are tort lawyers advertising uh, uh, their services for, have you been this, have you been that? So, Matt's obviously infected by that. Yeah. <laughs> um, if we're, uh, I lived in Texas for 17 years. Yes, sir. We recently had a, a rather severe drought. Uh, agriculture uses up quite a bit of the water. So to incentivize them to use less water, we put some things in front of their nose. Uh, if we're going to be looking at clean water, maybe we can incentivize them. What are some What are some that come to your mind? Uh, for clean water. If we're going to be letting them use water, they're going to have water law, which is going to be taking the water out of the ground, taking it out of a, a, a moving stream. So maybe we should look at water law as a way to go after clean water and structure it that way, rather than incentivize them with a different monetary system because they don't seem to care much about that. Huh. Or their pockets are so deep they can reach in. Well, I don't think for most of agriculture they look at themselves as having unlimited pockets, but but um, um, we are paying the money directly. That money is dwarfed by the money we're paying them to do exactly the wrong thing. Um, so unless that shift gets righted. We will fight every TMDL and every anchor ever. Um, unless we can arrive with right minded representatives of, of all interests at some, let's just settle this damn thing and do what we both realize ought to be done in a way that everybody agrees. <coughs> um, cool. Thank you. Good. Thank you.